The goal of science is to come to understand what is. We also want to understand how what is came about. There's no question that there are some processes in the brain that are not subject to volitional control and some processes that are. I'll use the words willed and volitional interchangeably. A volitional action is one that we could have willed to do otherwise for our own consciously knowable reasons. A non-volitional action is one that we could not have willed to do otherwise, regardless of what we might have consciously wanted to happen. For example, breathing usually proceeds automatically, without our conscious awareness. But breathing can be brought under volitional conscious control. Note that to say that it can be brought under conscious control means that it can be altered subject to one's will for whatever reasons one might have to do so. For example, if I, if I say to you, please breathe slowly, you can easily do so. If I say, now breathe to the rhythm of your favorite song, you can do that too. But there are other processes that we cannot bring under conscious or volitional control, even if we want to, no matter how hard we try. You have no conscious control over your blood pressure, and you can't will to make your heart beat to the rhythm of your favorite song. You cannot choose or will to alter unconscious processes. If you could, how would you even know that you had succeeded since we have no conscious access to unconscious processing? The vast majority of decisions and processes carried out in your brain and body are not subject to conscious volitional control. That's to say, they happen automatically and unconsciously. But a small subset are volitionally consciously controllable. What sets these volitional processes apart from the automatic ones? The eyes offer another good example. You cannot willingly stop making pupillary adjustments to light levels. Shine a bright light into your eyes and your pupils will get smaller, no matter what you want or will to happen. Remove the light and they'll get bigger again. However, the eyes also offer a good example of a case where you do have volitional control. Consider the large eye movements that you make when you look around the world. These are known as voluntary saccades. Indeed, where you will next move your eyes is a decision that you make three or four times a second, and this is a decision that you can volitionally regulate. The decision where to look next is probably the most common decision you make in your life. People make this class of voluntary decision thousands of times a day. For example, you can choose to look at trees, or people, or buildings, or really anything at all that your heart desires. You can even choose not to move your eyes at all, say if you're playing dead, or fixating on a fixation spot in an experiment in my lab. What we decide to look at next is not given by anything in the stimulus. It depends on factors in us, such as what we might desire or what we maintain in working memory as our present goal. For example, the psychologist Alfred Yarbus showed people the painting An Unexpected Visitor by Ilya Repin from 1884. What people looked at depended on what task he gave them. If he told them to estimate the material circumstances of the family, they exhibited a sequence of saccades such as shown here. But if subjects were told to assess the ages of the characters, their eye movements were quite different. If he told them to determine the activities of the family prior to the visitor's arrival, their eye movements tended to look like this. And if he asked them to please remember the character's clothes, they tended to move their eyes around like this. And finally, if he asked them to surmise how long the unexpected visitor had been away, their pattern of eye movements again were optimized to carry out this new task. It seems obvious that what we look at depends on our goals and that we could have moved our eyes differently than we did because we could have had different goals than we did. But who is this you inside your brain who decides to look at clothes rather than faces one moment but perhaps faces rather than clothes the next moment. Neuroscientists and philosophers would not want to argue that there is a little person known as a homunculus in your brain who decides where to move your eyes. This would lead to the philosophical dilemma known as an infinite regress, because who would then decide where this little homunculus will decide to move your eyes? Another homunculus inside his or her head, and so on, 
Who would want infinitely many little people inside little people inside little heads anyway? To avoid the problem of an infinite regress, neuroscientists talk about executive circuits, typically thought to be located in the frontal lobes, that can decide to search for red things or trees or children or whatever based upon operations in neural circuits that we call working memory. Voluntary eye movements can serve the flexible and arbitrarily redefinable aims of the moment. One of my goals as a neuroscientist is to try to figure out how such volitional acts and decisions are realized at the level of neural circuits. One of the major goals of this course is to understand how volitional decisions, such as where we choose to look next or where we choose to attend next, are carried out in the brain. A common move of philosophers who deny the existence of free will is to say, well, sure, there may appear to be a difference between non-volitional and volitional eye movements or other decisions, but even the seemingly voluntary decisions that we make are not really voluntary because where we voluntarily choose to next move our eyes is itself a decision that was made unconsciously and automatically, not subject to our consciously knowable reasons. Later in the course, we'll get into reasons to doubt such rejections of free will, but for now, let me just say that nature came up with neural processing that underlies willed or volitional decision-making. This came about over hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Whether philosophers decide to attribute free will to such volitional neural processes or not is largely irrelevant to the scientific goal of figuring out how volition or will works in the brain. By way of analogy, Arguing about whether a bonobo counts as a subspecies of chimpanzee or as a separate species, or arguing whether Greenland is a large island or a continent, or whether Pluto is a planet or a planetoid, is simply irrelevant to figuring out what bonobos or Greenland or Pluto are in the world and how they function as physical systems. Similarly, arguing whether volitional processes are free or not has no bearing on how they are realized in neural circuits. Neuroscientists don't sit in their armchairs. We think that studying what actually evolved is more urgent than discussing what can logically exist, especially since what evolved did not evolve to obey any logic. Whatever worked stuck around and what did not got eliminated. I don't think we can get very far in understanding volition in general or free will in particular without looking at how the nervous system actually realizes volitional decisions and actions.